Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac. And with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. <laughs> I think we've got some news items in there that uh, I can kind of relate to. Yeah, your uh, your day job is is uh, kicking kicking Taking, your butt right now. Turning, yeah. in, turning into a night job. <laughs> 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 yeah um yeah uh, it's uh it infrastructure so you know we support when servers go down so kind of a little bit of what we're dealing with right now but you know getting getting everybody back to where they need to be is it's kind of my job yeah so. part of the part of the job there <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and and well well to tr- transition into our first topic here i mean speaking of yeah <laughs> you <laughs> You you have nothing compared to the woes well, I don't that, have that bad no <laughs> that OVH has been facing recently. Uh, for for whoever hasn't seen it yet, there was a report that an OVH data center uh, had completely burnt down, uh, making knocking plenty of services offline. Uh, in a you know from from bleeping computer here for in a major unprecedented inc- incident, data centers of OVH located in Strasbourg, France have been destroyed by fire. Uh, and, and obviously we know that's always a risk in the data center. I mean, there's there's huge amounts of uh, cooling infrastructure. And I remember when I went to take my network certification test, there was an entire section on that around, you know, how do you, th- how do you, how do you wire things in a data center? You know, what is a data center to look like uh, in order to not cause a catastrophic meltdown? You know, how, how, how do you, how do you, make sure that these things don't happen and and it really doesn't which is why this is news so it which is which is pretty good i mean the the industry as a whole kind of has a good idea of of how this should be done having hot and cold rows uh and and just kind of di- different different architectures to use uh i did see a follow-up to this in a retro uh, where the ovh founder said that the UPS that was fixed up a day before is a suspect uh, as the source of the data center destruction. Um, good news, obviously, is that uh, there were no casualties, uh, but there yeah. there's a lot of, of grumbling about data loss. And I, I, I guess I wanted to, to kind of hone in on that and say, why is it that if one data center burnt down, People would suffer data loss. Are you asking me? I said, why did they store their? Why did they put their? If OVH should have been smart enough to replicate across sites, that's that's my default go to. Or why did, I guess, people arch? Why did anyone using those cloud services architect their systems to only use one data center? So yeah, I <laughs> was. What, that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, those, I mean, those are actually the two parties that I wanted to to kind of hone in on. So where. Where would you start with the argument between the the two of those, uh, between the data center, uh, the o- OVH, the provider themselves, as as well as their tenants? So, like, where would <laughs> I'd say show me a contract? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, because it's all defined on based on what service you're getting, right? Are you paying for? Are you as a tenant paying for fully managed? Are you paying for virtual servers? Are you paying for physical rack space? Are you paying for? You know the servers themselves. Obviously, as a, cr- a cloud provider, what I would look for is uh, I would want redundancy across sites. But with that being said, as the cloud provider, I'd put it on my tenants to basically point at them and say, "Okay, we offer multiple sites within our infrastructure. You have to you have to be the one to architect your systems to use those different sites." So I think it should be provided yeah and that's kind of what i think of it, it should be provided multiple sites but it should be architected by the tenants in a way that they use the multiple sites if that make if that kind of makes sense yeah and and having gone through and and acquiring my aws practitioner certification right a- amazon has their concept of regions and availability zones now regions will be different places throughout the world. You can have like the Western United States, you can have Eastern United States, you can have Germany, you can have South Africa, you can have uh, Asia, Central Asia, et cetera, et cetera. And then within those 
global regions, right? That that are that are defined on a global level, you're going to have availability zones within those regions. So each region is going to have three or four different data centers within them that you are going to have to choose where your services live. So if you're, as a tenant, trying to architect a resilient service, what you're going to do is you're going to use multiple availability zones as a failover process or any any kind of resiliency that you're going to build in, you're going to build in probably using those availability zones. Now, the reason is you're going to use those rather than the global regions is because you don't want your traffic going out to South Africa if all of your tenants are in New York, right? You, right. You, you're going to want to keep that round trip pretty low. So you're going to, you're going to put all the services in that general area. But if you have your services spread out between two or three data centers or at least available to deploy or, or, or provide service from any one of those availability zones, it's going to be in the same region. But if something catastrophic like this happens, you know, in, in uh, colloquially, colloquially known as a crater event where, where a whole data center just craters, you know, or, you know, asteroid craters a data center, what, what then, right? Well, in right. AWS's case, you have a different availability zone, a digital ocean, uh, Linode, all of the, the major cloud providers are going to have a similar type solution for that. As, as well, OVH had, had multiple data centers available too within the, within the same region. And you, you see a lot of the tenants complaining about data loss and this is catastrophic. I think it was, it was uh, the Rust developers, the game, the Rust developers, uh, whatever their production company is had all of their servers in that one data center and it wiped all of their data. Ooh. Yeah. Ow. Yeah. And that's, I think that you have to ask yourself, what service are you also using? Like, where are they storing stuff on, you know, VP, like virtual servers? Like, are they storing all their data on VPSs or is it something abstracted that they're, I think of storage, like Amazon's S3 that's out there and storage solutions that are out there. Um, I know we kind of had the discussion on NFS mounts as a provider, but I'd expect for, you know, something abstracted away like that, that OVH, OVH would be on the hook for data storage and services like that. Now, if you're running bare metal, you're kind of, that's up to you to architect how you want to do backups and do your storage solution for that. Yeah, I would, I would agree in that if you're simply leasing a VM or rack space, then, then yeah, you're you're gonna be provided that and no backups. But if you're you're a managed service, which could go anywhere from you know a database as a service all the way up to platform as a service, or simply software as a service, that should absolutely be architected in a way to be resilient. Now you got a lot of platform as a service companies using OVH under the hood. You have a lot of uh, software as a service companies using OVH under the hood. Those are the tenants that need to be aware that this needs to be, you know, not in a single data center. So uh, obviously this is where, where backups and some kind of replication would come into place. Uh, and uh, like like DigitalOcean's uh, snapshots, right? Those are per region, not per data center. So those, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, would be available in the event of one data center, yeah, a, a, a crater event, and, and uh, that would be available in the same region in a different data center to spin up. So there's... There's a, a example of a managed service that the cloud provider is actually providing to the, the infrastructure teams who are setting this up for whatever software is a service, uh, like, like something that our Compose uh, would be providing, right? We keep the, the backups, we have the snapshots, uh, and those are something we can move around between data centers if necessary. But that did, that did uh, kind of draw everyone's attention to to, we're, we're, totally you know, a data center burned down totally <laughs> i mean how often does that happen think it, about that exactly exactly so uh like luckily you know no one no one was in there and uh it looks like everyone well and obviously there's going to be more discussion on you know who, who to go with next uh hertzner is another provider over in the eu there that's that's fairly popular uh we use DigitalOcean. Uh, linode came in a close second when we were making our decisions and obviously aws and gcp uh, are our front runners as well i think we ruled out oracle cloud though pretty early on 
Yeah, obviously, yeah, yes. <laughs> I think they've been having <laughs> what more and more issues <laughs> as time progresses. <laughs> yes, <laughs> kind of what I've seen. Yeah, but they they do have a they do have an interesting relationship with open source. Um, I think isn't Oracle Cloud? Hold on. No, I'm thinking of IBM Cloud because IBM has a cloud too. Yeah, and IBM Cloud just. IBM as the company just acquired Red Hat and I'm, I'm assuming they're trying to make a play there. Right. And, and you see more of these open source companies um, going IPOing. Uh, the latest I've heard was SUSE is now eyeball, eyeballing uh, going public within the next, within the year. I, I, I think by summer, that, yeah. I think they said, um, and, and this is just a, a re- this is a trend. I, I, I don't know why I, I and I'm not going to speculate, but I can I can I think I could safely say this is a trend. And so I'm, I'm going to keep my eye on this and and try to tie back uh, what we're what we're seeing in the news and, and see if I can't find some some kind of driver uh, that is that is initializing stuff like that. Now, we have a report from the register that starts talking about, you know, why is, why is everyone interested, you know, suddenly so interested in open source, um, whether it be these companies uh, who are capitalizing it or smaller applications and smaller developers, you know, we have GitHub loving open source. We have Microsoft loving open source. You know, we have, we have all this push that we see around the developer tooling that says, let's start embracing open source, you know, and let's start extending open source. And I hope it doesn't get to let's start is- extinguishing open source, but that is yet to be seen. That's still a conspiracy, but we'll leave it there for the time being. Uh, however, I, I, I think there are rational reasons why people are doing this. And, and by rational, I mean, they're doing it for their own benefit, right? They're, they're doing it for self-interested reasons, which is why anyone does anything. And and the register had a really good take on it. And, and they were talking about, you know, have you ever wondered why the big beasts in software all suddenly slapped an iHeart open source badge on? And they're talking about here that there's a there's been a shift uh, within the enterprise to open source uh, and how it's how it's gathering pace uh, do less to total cost do, due to do less the total cost of ownership and more towards innovations around infrastructure and container technologies. Uh, so the, the registers take here is that yes, open source is free as in beer, uh, except for, you know, all the licenses and the service and support contracts. That's almost a given added on when you start talking about enterprise software, but they're also talking about why, why specifically infrastructure is being touted as the reason to switch to open source why we're not seeing a lot of proprietary solutions being being on the forefront of the the infrastructure side of enterprise technology and we see here that uh let me find it i think you hit the nail on the head it's innovation yeah. right well it is i mean it you is look innovation at- yeah you start to look at these services, especially around infrastructure. I, the immediate one I kind of think of, um, it's very much, I, I still call it futuristic. It's just still coming in as a technology as Kubernetes and managed, basically managed container deployments, orchestrate that whole world around orchestration is what immediately comes to my mind. Yeah. And, and uh, you versus see, mm-hmm. a monolithic application, you have these small, uh, what is it, microservices basically deploying and orchestration tools that are basically saying hey you know what put in you know some some bare metal install you know operating system load up you know this one service and then basically toss it in the toss it in the fire and you know we'll we'll kind of take care of the rest being you know we being uh kubernetes is the big one so Kubernetes is a big one. I'm not I'm not 100% sold on Kubernetes, but I think I am 100% sold on virtualization and containerization as an idea. So well, I'm going to I'm going to sure. I'm going to leave okay. Kubernetes yeah. aside, but I am going to focus on what the survey actually said. So yeah, yeah. The Go for it. what what the register had reported here was that uh, 64% of respondents cited infrastructure modernization as the top use for enterprise okay. open source. 
and that's up from 53% two years ago. So almost a 10% bump. Now that could be anything from let's go to the bleeding edge to we are still running a mainframe and need to get off of it, right? So so you have old old infrastructure and they want to modernize it. So in order to do that, the easiest way and and a lot of the old infrastructure is still money making. So from a business perspective, you're still gonna have, yeah. Totally, it's hard to say why do we need to modernize this? It just works right now. Exactly, you, you're you either gonna have to make a business case that you're actually losing money running the technology and that's gonna be, that's gonna have to be uh, man hours, that's gonna have to be uh, you know electricity cost, maintenance cost, support and contract cost, right? So you're either gonna have to claim that or you're gonna have to claim that the security risk is too high. So there's, there's too big of a downsize and a too large uh, security uh, impact it totally foothold impact yeah that that could potentially like if you if you have a mainframe that holds all uh, the the PII or all of the uh, the the credit card information for for all of your clients right that is a big surface area for attack that is been known and probably not passed for a, a long while right so you're gonna have to put in mitigating controls you're gonna have to put in you know defense in depth you're gonna have to architect around that in order to to have a a to mitigate that risk and if you don't mitigate that risk right you your your, your downside is huge right you have a big surface area and you have a valuable target there to to attack so so you're gonna have to use one of those two arguments right and the easiest counter argument to make is look we can spin up the new infrastructure with open source that's not going to cost us this this old licensing model that we had to use for our vendor you know back in the day back you know a decade ago two decades ago in the early aughts right we're we're not locked into that anymore we can modernize our infrastructure at least up to you know virtualized servers or or even you know right. bare metal servers that's still going to be better than than what you have uh, on a on a old tape running mainframe like it's it, sure. it's it's just that's just not sustainable um obviously uh, technology keeps moving faster and faster uh we don't see anything slowing down if you can get into cloud and and that's actually interesting cloud is not actually in this survey well at least not in the the top three answers with the other two being application development which if you're if you're going to be open source you're going to be supporting developers most likely right and those developers are going to be developing stuff they're going to expect a modernized development pipeline and <laughs> the nebulous quote unquote digital transformation uh coming uh third so these these aren't focusing on specific areas like containers or cloud, right? These are saying, look, we have old enterprise solutions and open source is the the way to modernize that has the least amount of friction for us. Now you have, you have a couple other things. So like edge computing, uh, AI and machine learning uh, that, that also came out of this. Uh, but but I, I, I think I think the takeaway is what's really pushing open source, where or where you see all these companies going, which is which is why you're seeing a lot of the distribution vendors uh, making a lot of the news currently, is because you need the infrastructure to keep up with all the developments that your crazy developers are doing, which is just my take on it. But I I I, I, I was very interested to see this this report back back me up on it. Which is which is why we chose, you know, in, instead of me working on my home lab, uh, making making this a you know Proxmox specific thing, or, or or using what was I using on there before? I think it was uh, uh, KVM uh, Libvirt, right? And instead of doing that, I was like, look, look I'm just I'm just going to use the infrastructure that's that's already available to us. I I don't want to have to deal with this. All right, I'm just going to contract with a with a cloud provider. Uh, and and go that route because uh, I I know in order to to keep up uh, with all the l latest releases security updates etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah we're 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 gonna have to be agile we're we're gonna need that low barrier to to maintenance sustainability uh, because I I couldn't keep up otherwise just just you and you and me like we we can only do so much so <laughs> uh, but. 
but but I think that is huge uh, infrastructure in general, which is which is why it's my favorite kind of realm uh, in IT for for the time being. Um, so I, I I guess I'll just move on to developments uh, next, uh, having okay. having covered that. So we have a, a couple here. The first one is that compositional 2.6.4 has been published. So we're continuing with the 2.6 line. Uh, some minor updates. Uh, we were talking about uh, Bitwarden's latest update. So we've hit the uh, previous minor version. So 1.18 is the one that is currently rolling out in 2.6 stable. Uh, Nextcloud 20 as well 21 having just come out uh, several days ago next cloud 20 is going to be rolling out as well uh, that is the first one that defaults to the dashboard as its default view uh, we are going to be going into that later because i i, I left uh, our talk today on next cloud is next cloud 19 that should be what everyone's running currently uh, and then 20 is going to be the next upgrade. And we could probably touch on that even next episode uh, and, and go over the dashboard. But it it comes with a whole bunch of other other features that we'll, we'll run into as well. Um, there were two other quality of life features that snuck into this release. Uh, one was a pipe fail for the quicker failure. So every time we run a bind mount point, we rely on the container that we're doing the bind, bind mount point from uh, being up. And if for some reason between the latest, the, the first health check that we did when we initialized the container and when we are executing the bind mount points, if the container fails within that time frame, the bind mount point would get about five or six tasks in and then fail. Right. Which which was a pain to trace back which container it actually failed on because it starts doing all of the containers at once. So I'd have to trace back individually which container it actually failed on. Uh, so this will actually fail quicker and give us a better feedback of you know what's actually having a problem and and we can go from there. Um, and then the the other one that I'd run into during migrations was that maintenance mode was actually still on for some Nextcloud instances uh, after after the migration had occurred. So we are now making sure to disable that after we have a successful migration. Uh, that is should be pretty standard. Um, and, and I didn't see a lot of instances where that happened. It, it seemed to be some of the older, older instances. Um, so I don't know if this is something when it was stood up and uh, never got switched back off, but it's uh, we're, we're, we're able to catch it. Uh, at this time. Uh, and then the last one was actually a, uh, a blog post I decided to make. So I, I, I linked it in the show notes here, uh, but I, I decided to write it up as a, as a separate personal blog post because it was something that I, I went just incredibly into the weeds on. Uh, so this is, this is more of a technical deep dive than anything. It's, it's more so akin to how the, the bound, bind mount points are set up. Uh, but to, to go over it briefly, uh, because it, I, I do think it's it's interesting and, and relevant for the, the techies here, uh, is that how we spin up droplets was affected by how Ubuntu sets up their servers. Ubuntu sets up their servers with auto updates turned on. And the first time that you spin up a server, it goes out to check and see if there are any updates to apply, which is sure. fine security practice wise. I mean, I, I want security updates that <laughs> that's a thing right. I'd like to have. <laughs> uh, however, that means that for the first about five minutes or so, uh, the server can't actually install any additional packages. And what we were running into is that we went to update all the packages on the system and install some additional ones that we needed for, for functionality. And it would, instead of waiting, it would simply error out because the automatic upgrade process held a file lock on the upgrade process, which, which is, nice. is, you know, is, is, you don't want to, processes updating your system at once that is no that is a recipe for disaster so what we we were running into was a a safeguard of sorts but it was a safeguard that we had to work around well 
my development cycle in Ansible goes like this. I, I see an error out in the wild. I find a way to manually as a proof of concept reproduce that error uh, and then find a workaround that works in it and then per a workaround in the code. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we were, we were, I was trying to reproduce this and in doing so I, I couldn't run another update because the update finished in like three seconds because this server was already updated instead of the five minutes that it had had taken initially. So okay. I couldn't rerun the update to reproduce the file lock. And and I, I, I knew which file it was. So I'm like, okay, let me let me go ahead and, and just take, open it for take writing ownership. Or something? Yeah, exactly. Open yeah. open that file okay. for writing, right? Which should be easy enough, right? Uh, unfortunately, Ubuntu's app get their 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 actually D package uh, uses a different type of file lock that does not honor any other types of file locks. So any other possible way I would have to hold that file lock open, D package wouldn't even recognize or or honor, and it would just go ahead and do what it wanted to just anyways. Right over it or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. So there ends up being a different program that is able to mimic that system call to oh take a, a yeah. lock on that file to, to have that file lock. Uh, so I had to, I had to install that, uh, get that file lock specifically. And I just ran like a sleep 200 uh, to, to hold that open for 200 seconds. And then I was able to run the Ansible command to reproduce that error. So finally I was able to fail successfully. So once I had that failure, it was it was pretty smooth sailing. Um, I just had to figure out how I wanted to to test for that error uh, and 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 catch that error. But but diving down into I was gonna say, look at that diving into system calls right there. Exactly. Yeah. I love I love you're just like yeah, sleep two hundred, <laughs> sleep two hundred with it locked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like that will at least give me enough time to rerun Ansible. A couple minutes. <laughs> And then I was able to, you know, fiddle with uh, different failure conditions uh, for tasks within Ansible, and doing a proactive test uh, after after doing that. Um, the the weirdest thing was though, since it required an additional tool set to detect that file lock, I had to first install that tool set. But I couldn't install that tool set because it was updated because <laughs> it's locked. So I had to take the ugly route, which was to just retry installing it okay, until okay. it successfully installed. Actually, so that's what we were doing before. We were actually just sleeping for two minutes or five minutes and then trying to reinstall, re trying to install stuff. And generally that had been okay. But for some reason I started getting just a whole rash of deploys that weren't okay because it ran into this. So I'm like, all right, now it's becoming an actual problem. I got to solve it correctly rather than just putting a timeout on it. So having, having been able to successfully reproduce the error, uh, I was, I was able to, to kind of work around that, but that took me a solid six hours of just banging, banging away at, 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 at system calls. End of the day, uh, all's well that ends well, but it was an interesting deep dive nonetheless. That's awesome though, yeah. And that's the stuff I live for. I mean, I'd... A little bit quicker, right? A little bit quicker rather than timing out two minutes where... Yeah, exactly. And then take it down. Deploys are just getting quicker and quicker. Exactly. I, I think the average deploy now is down just a little underneath 11 minutes. Uh, I would love to get that down below three, if at all possible. Uh, but we'll, we'll see where we take our goals uh, in Q2. And we'll see where we're going with that. Uh, we're going to have another episode before that. So we can we can touch on that a little bit closer to the time we're, we're getting together. But uh, yeah, that that could be something that we we look to implement to get to get quicker and quicker. Actually, a lot of a lot of what we're doing is is getting us quicker and quicker. So so very happy about that. I think with that, we are going to jump into our integration discussion here. It's on Nextcloud. Uh, you have groupware and settings listed. I want to make the correction now and say it, it's settings we're going over in, I guess it's, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Embedded applications or what kind of what comes out of the box. It's not any of the third party apps or apps by Nextcloud. It's kind of like what I think of as, uh, the photo viewer, the PDF viewer. I think I, I put editing 
documents in there. I don't know if that is part of that suite or not. That's uh, embedded. I think there's a music player. So it's it's all the built-in applications, and and it's 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 everything that comes with the vanilla Nextcloud install, without having to install anything additional. Any kind of yeah. So so I'm going to go through those and then I'm going to go through the settings as they exist on a vanilla install. Uh, stuff to okay. tweak, stuff to yeah. be aware of, uh, stuff to look over. Uh, now, I did want to to take a second, this being the, the 20th episode, right? I, I wanted to, to kind of re-go over uh, something that, that I stole uh, that's called the 10 episode challenge, uh, which is... Go back and listen to the last 10 episodes uh, of what you're doing, uh, and then you would be in a prime place uh, to jump in to, to see what we're doing here, right? And and this might even be you know something like a, a five-episode challenge because all the news items that we're covering build on each other. Uh, all of the, the services, like we, we talked about NextCloud in the previous episode, right? And before that, we had gone through Canboard, and Canboard took... 10 episodes yeah i might even recommend just going through all the canboard episodes just to catch it just to kind of catch up just to go through and understand how we're doing this just to at least understand the structure exactly and that is something that we have fixed or, or that will be coming out as as fixed on the updated version on monday right so as we're we're rolling out a couple new features to the site we're going to be grouping all the canboard episodes together right we're going to be grouping all the next cloud episodes together so you're going to be able to go through those and you're going to be able to start at the beginning and say all right what was the first you know episode that they talked about next cloud and uh i think that was actually the very first episode the the shebang it was. yeah yeah it was yeah so we we kind of introduced the concept of us hosting a next cloud instance in the very first episode and we are circling back to it and we're going to dive in depth for the next Oh man, it could it could easily be ten episodes that we touch on the different aspects of Nextcloud and and going over the different uh, things that you can do with it, the different setups, the different considerations. Uh, but right now uh, we're we're just starting off, so we'll we'll see where this takes us. And this episode specifically, the second in this series, is going to go through built-in applications and the settings. Uh, so without further me talking, uh, let's go ahead and and see what we have here. Uh, so the, the built-in applications uh, in NextCloud, the m majority of the functionality is an app, quote-unquote. Uh, there are many apps that come pre-installed and pre-configured. Uh, as an administrator, you can find them under the apps menu in any view in, in NextCloud. Uh, note that starting with NextCloud 20, the default homepage is the application dashboard instead of the files application. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, and I do have a link in the linked show notes or the link, excuse me, the linked documentation has a, has a link to NextCloud's dashboard documentation where you can find out more about how that's supposed to work and how to set that up and how to configure it. I, I would assume we're going to go through that uh, one of these days. I Probably when we're more familiar with it, as this is a feature that is fairly new and has just been rolled out. So I haven't really had uh, a good chance to play with it yet, uh, but I would be interested in diving in there sooner or later to see what we can do with it. Uh, now, I have a list of applications here that are built in. Uh, and I have them listed simply in in uh, alphabetical order, and I, I have them listed here to make users aware of the functionality that is bundled in with a default Nextcloud install. So right out of the box, this is what you're getting, and and here are some to be aware of. This is no means by no means comprehensive. This is simply an overview of of the most important ones that you're going to have available to you. Uh, so the first one is going to be activity. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go through the summary of what activity is. So this application enables users to view actions related to their files in Nextcloud. Once enabled, users will see a new icon activity in their apps menu. When clicked, a new page appears for users to track the activity related to files, from new files to deleted files, moving, renaming, updating, and any sharing activity that occurs. The user can configure their individual activity settings in their personal menu. 
This sets the type of activity to record, as well as whether the user sees their own activities, whether these are only available offline, and whether they get an email digest on a regular basis. More on that later. Uh, and then you have the documentation linked to that. Uh, so that's going to be anything, I mean, as, as I just said, that's going to be anything that you're doing. Nextcloud is going to show you basically a, a, a history of what has been done, what files uploaded, uh, what files uh, have been moved, renamed, updated, or shared. There's not much to add on that one. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's quite literally the activity, what's going on in Nextcloud. All right, so I, I got a couple more here, so I'm just going to... I'm just going to run run through these. If you have anything to comment on or, or something anecdotally, just go ahead and jump in. Uh, the next the next application here is comments, uh, and this is this is probably the most succinct description of all of the ones that is, are listed here. And it says it's a file app plugin to add comments to files. I don't necessarily use it that often, but I can imagine if you know we're starting to share files back and forth. If I wanted to put a little note on something. It's nice to know that it, that's built in there. Now, there's there's a thing about where do you go to do your communication, like and and communication. I always consider to be a an aspect of data ingest. So, like if I'm getting communication via email, if I'm getting communication via net can board, if I'm getting communication via uh, matrix, right? I want to keep those limited so i'm not trying to data ingest from 500 different places right especially if right. if you're making a comment in nextcloud and i don't check that for a week and a half but i got email open i got matrix open right what are our known forms of communication like what what have we agreed right. to to have as our primary mode of communication not nextcloud comments i'll tell you that uh, but if if need be that is there um, so, so just note that Jack, if you make a comment on a next file, I'm probably not going to check it. I'm probably not going to see it. <laughs> I think of uh, media. I think for media for comments, that's what I go to. I don't. I don't think of it as a communications method for. Shoot, hey, I need you to review this document. No, I would send you a ping in Matrix. I'd be like, hey, you know, check this out, or I'd put it if it was a file related to a task. Which, guess what, most of them are. I would put in that I would put in the task because I know that's where you're going to look. You're not going to look on the file for comments on the file. Exactly, exactly. Um, but if you want to remind yourself for something, feel free to free to go ahead. Just note that I'm not going to be reading it. Uh, the next plugin here we have is deleted files. Uh, this application enables users to restore files that were deleted from the system. It displays a list of deleted files in the web interface and has options to restore those deleted files back to users' file directories or remove them permanently from the system. Restoring a file also restores related file versions if the versions application is enabled. When a file is deleted from a share, it can be restored in the same manner, though it is no longer shared. By default, these files remain in the trash bin for 30 days. To prevent a user from running out of disk space, the deleted files app will not utilize more than 50% of the currently available free quota for deleted files. If the deleted files exceed this limit, the app deletes the oldest files until it gets below this limit. And then uh, they also have documentation linked there. Now, this is interesting, uh, I guess, for a compliance standpoint, but for me, more so from a disk utilization standpoint, to know that the deleted files are not actually deleted when they're deleted, but they take 30 days, they're placed in what amounts to a, a trash like a trash bin like you would have on your computer that you would have to manually go and, and delete. But in this case, does it every 30 days um, or well times, times the file out after 30 days means that space right. is actually still being consumed until that file is deleted until those 30 days are up. Uh, now it can be manually gone out and deleted, or if it gets above 50% of the available free quota, it will start pruning, which is a, a very sane default. For me, actually, I'm I'm very okay with that, and I believe there are corresponding settings where you can tweak that to say I want it to expire earlier, or I want it to take up less less or more disk space uh, in in the trash. Uh, but it it is interesting that on the surface it looks like you may have deleted a file, but you actually have thrown it into the trash bin where it will sit 
for approximately the next 30 days before it gets removed. So in, in case you delete something, you should always have a re restore available to you. Now, our backups uh, do keep snapshots of the file in case you delete something and it's been past 30 days. Uh, we have, we keep long lived Backup. backups. Yeah. yeah. Now it would, we would have to, to check to see at what time frame that backup occurred. And you know, it, it it's a good chance though that that file is enabled on the system unless you put it in there and immediately deleted it. But we we should have at least some remediation there uh, to, to go back and, and examine to see if we can't cherry pick that file back from, from one of our uh, R Compose backups. Uh, the next application here uh, that I wanted to highlight is file sharing. So this application enables users to share files within Nextcloud. If enabled, the admin can choose which groups can share files. The applicable users can then share files and folders with other groups and users within Nextcloud. In addition, if the admin enables the share link feature, an external link can be used to share files with other users outside of Nextcloud. Admins can also enforce passwords, expiration dates, and enable server-to-server -server sharing via share links the federated sharing, as well as sharing from mobile devices. Turning the feature off removes shared files and folders on the server for all share recipients and also on the sync clients and mobile apps. Uh, and as well, I have linked documentation here. Uh, this is probably what I use Nextcloud for the most. Uh, this is what I use when I need to have my uncle upload my cousin's wedding videos. Uh, I, I tell him here is a share link that is upload only. Uh, go ahead and upload all of the files that you have into this link and then I will have them to use them and, and, and edit right. them. Um, this is what I use when I need to provide tax documentation uh, to accountant agencies where I say, all right, here is the link um, I have previously given you a password because I would password protect that share and using that password, they can go retrieve that publicly. So, so I think that is, that is my most beneficial way that I use Nextcloud. That, that helps me out the most is just having that you need files that I have that are too big for email. What do now? Right. I like that one. Yeah. Because I think, I don't know what the limit is uh, for emails at, 30 meg, 5 meg? It depends on your email provider, but it is somewhere close to 30 meg. Yeah. So it's definitely a lot easier to just, and especially with that, you're also getting, you can just send one link versus attaching however many files. You know, say there wasn't a limit via email. It's like, well, now you have kind of a, not a permanent home, but more or less a permanent place for these files to be stored and for whoever needs to get them. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I've been very happy with that. Obviously, that also enables uh, federated sharing and it enables user-to-user uh, -user sharing within that Nextcloud instance. Uh, so plenty of other things uh, to touch on too. I think I'm going to leave off the federation uh, sharing and I know we talked about user-to-user -user sharing in the previous episode. So I'll just, I'll leave that at that uh, and continue on. Uh, I do have, I think it's, six more applications. So I'm going to try to run through these real quick and then we'll get to settings and, and move on here. The PDF reader application is the next application on the list of ones I wanted to highlight. Uh, so this application enables, integrates the PDF.js library into Nextcloud. Using this application, users can view their PDF files online without the need to download the file. When this application is enabled, publicly shared PDF documents also get shown in the PDF viewer instead of only showing a single static snapshot of the document. The PDF viewer requires a modern browser, does not work with Microsoft Internet Explorer versions below 9, which no one should be using anyways. I, I was going to say. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully that limitation is not something you're concerned about. If you are, find help. Find help. Um... PDF.js is a JavaScript library developed by Mozilla. You can learn more about PDF project at their homepage there. Uh, so real quick, we all know what a PDF is and how to see it in a browser. This is enabled by default. So if your 
expecting to be able to read PDF files in Nextcloud, that feature is already there. Like I said, a lot of these yep. are, are built in. A lot of them are functionality you would expect to see. It's just the way Nextcloud structures their plugin architecture, their their application architecture. These are all modular components to the system. And I wanted to highlight them as we go down uh, to, to show the functionality that is available on a vanilla system. Yeah, and I really like that you highlighted that it's because in that you specifically that you attach the GitHub link to the project, um, at least for most of these built-in ones, because I was I thought it was kind of developed as one monolith, mon, one monolith, essentially. Knowing that it's split and spread apart, and that you have different plugin, different, uh, what do you want to call it? Core features, Appli built-in yeah. features, yeah, just like the application features, they're modular it boils down to their module you know you can switch it out if you don't like it it's not you don't have to remaster the entire code base you just kind of have to know one piece of it exactly exactly so you can you can swap these out and uh, as i'm sure we're going to find out next week you can install others so uh the next one to touch on is photos this one actually doesn't have a paragraph written about it they, they simply have bullet points um with emojis so as as much as we love as much as we love pictures different developer stuff probably. On here. oh yeah no, no completely different team i'm sure uh decided to, to take the uh the the bullet point uh route here the emoji route emoji route yeah thanks guys uh photos um this application actually i know has was was recently reworked uh, there was there's a whole bunch of backend op optimization done uh, which led to a couple of headaches because there was a feature re regression um, where there were were features that were not implemented in the new one that uh, you know were, were available in the old one uh, I haven't checked on those recently so I'll have to I'll have to see where they are currently but it does come with a vanilla install um, it has, you know, its highlights are that it's a beautiful photo and video timeline uh, available. Uh, it supports favorites and tagging, like tagging photos. Uh, my favorite feature, uh, you can link directly to a side slideshow and, and, and easily share that. So you can, you can simply share a slideshow. Try saying that three times fast. And, uh, and, and, and that's just going to be like a photo album. Like you would just share a regular photo album. Uh, and and then you would create those photo albums inside of that that photos application. It looks you know basically like rearranging a bunch of files in in the different albums. Like it's it's not complicated at all. Uh, it, it it's nothing fancy either, uh, but it it does a job uh, in and does it a little bit more efficiently now. Hopefully. Question for you on that photos app. I think it might be an add on app, but the identification i think it's like face identification or photo identification it might be an add-on i think i was under the impression it was built in but it might be third party it, it probably is if they didn't highlight it um basically i think it uses you know face recognition to recognize who's in what photos and you can kind of search by those photos well i know here you can manually tag photos uh, but yeah, that might be something interesting for you to bring up in the next episode. Yeah, to to see if that is indeed a a a, a application an application that can be installed. Yeah. Um, the next one is recommendations. This is probably my most hated application that comes bundled natively into Nextcloud. So this shows recommended files for quick access of files and folders with recent activity. Now we had gone yeah. over. Uh, I think in, you can disable it. We talked about it. Last week, I think we talked about it last week. You can disable that, and then I think there's one that's the other. My other setting that I dislike is the default. It just starts like notes almost. It just starts you off with a cursor, and I said, "Why? No, I don't need this. I'm uploading files, not writing a story right now." So next cloud, stop. Yeah, um, yeah. So that is that is something that I actually didn't know how to disable for the longest time. I just hadn't cared that much and i was like this stupid thing is really dumb and it's across the top banner and i didn't even see it in the bottom left corner of every single screen is the little settings where you can just go and unclick that check mark box and and uh, i never have to see it again and that is just you know made my life so much easier so so i'm gonna 
I'm gonna have to be doing that from now on. But uh, yeah, so that's that's an easy one to turn off, and I would I would recommend that be turned off unless for some reason you just love seeing everything that you have just completed. I mean, that's what it is. It, it's most recently. T- I mean, <laughs> the recommendation engine is basically what have you most recently touched. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next application here is text, and this is collaborative document editing. Uh, so this is uh, simple text. This isn't Collabora, which would have like the this isn't document, right? This cor- is like Markdown file. Correct. This is raw text files. This is this is not a word processor collaborative editing suite. That is something that is available, and something I think we should touch on. Um, but not something that is enabled by default. This is this is simply raw text files. Um, but you can share and collaborate, you know, with whoever you want to. And and I'm assuming you could do that on on a public share as well. It it, it seems to indicate here. Um, and all the files that you're writing are saved as Markdown, which is our favorite markup language. Uh, and they have, you know, more open source underneath the hood uh, that's that's powering this. Uh, so that's that's a really quick and easy way to do collaborative uh, document editing. Uh, but there are more refined platforms that, if you're looking to do that, you may be more interested in. Like I said, such as Collabora, um, and I think I don't know if only Office powers that or if. Only Office is a separate implementation. Either way, I'm sure we're going to dive into that later. Uh, the last two I wanted to dive in here is the usage survey, uh, which sends anonymized data to Nextcloud to help us to improve Nextcloud. Uh, now, the instance uh, at owner, the the application owner, the the admin, always has full control over the content sent to Nextcloud, and it can be disabled at any time. Uh, So that is, actually, I want to dive into all the specs that you can see when we take a look at the settings about a given server. So we're going to, we're going to take a look at that, but there is anonymized data that by default, I believe, is being sent to Nextcloud. Uh, So we've, we've talked about how uh, sending statistics back helps the overall development cycle and, and, you know, how that, how that really works. So we're going to, I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, I do have the documentation link so you can see what is all is being sent back and how it's anonymized, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it is something that can be turned off in an instance. So if that's still something you're just not comfortable with, go ahead and, and turn it off. And that's why I wanted to make sure to highlight it to give you the option to do that. Um, and then the last one here, and like I said, this is just alphabetical order. So video player uh, is actually the last one on the page. And the video player is just a responsive video player, so you can watch MP3s, WebMs, or MP4s, WebMs, what, whatever. What AVIs uh, are all should all be viewable uh, with that built-in video player. So it's it's fairly standard. Uh, just another great feature that I would expect to be in there is in there. So nothing nothing really to expound about. Uh, Jack, before I move on, do you do you feel like I touched on all of the applications that I came in here? Is there some kind of glaring hole that I didn't uh, hit on? No, it doesn't look like it. Uh, the one thing I note is that a lot of these are JavaScript, which I guess makes sense because they're all part of that front end. But nothing's, I guess, is touching that data on the back end. You know, you don't need PHP for a lot of this stuff. You just need, I guess, access to the files. Um, but I don't know. It's interesting because I just see a lot of them are, it looks like JavaScript based applications. So, well, and also what that allows us to do, which is something I think we should touch on as well is writing separate, completely separate applications for mobile use. And then using that to contact the server backend and interact with it like it was the front end application. Uh, so just another way that it, it makes itself more modular there. With that then, let's move on to settings. And this is just going to be a brief overview of the settings that were interesting to me on a vanilla install. Now this is from the point of view of an administrator. So I'm going to go over two sections sections here. I'm going to go over the personal settings section. And I'm also going to go over the administrative settings section. 
So the, the personal settings section has several subsections that are available. Initially, it has uh, personal info, then security, activity, mobile and desktop, accessibility, sharing, flow, and privacy. So there's a ton of things in these subsections that you can go in and explore. I, I don't know. I guess I'm weird. And, and, and Jack, you're going to have to, to, to level set me on this. But when I do anything, when I spin up a new instance of an application, when I install a new OS on my phone, when I, when yeah. I anything, the first thing I do is go around and see just what am I able to tweak about this. Like I don't, I don't go to like use it or you know see how fast it is or how responsive it is. I want to see what are they allowing me to change in here. Like, am I? Am, is that just me, or or do other people do that too? Uh, that's a good question. I honestly go through. No, I. You know what I go to? I go to what? What's third party that I can install? I, I don't know if that's on the same page or not. That is, yeah. I, I automatically jump to like, all right, what kind of cool features does, can I, it's not what's already here. It's what kind of cool features can I add on to what's already here? <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, that is. That's really. So I guess I go to plugins maybe. Yeah. yeah I, I kind yeah. of jump to plugins. How can I customize this? How can I throw it on? Whereas I go to, all right, what are they allowing me to do here? How can I, how can I tweak this? So, so for me, settings is actually very interesting. I, I put a lot of weight on, you know, what, what comes out of the box? What can I, what are they actually allowing me to do? You know, how can I make this my own? So there are a couple of recommendations going through just the personal section that I say, all right, here, here's uh, some of the cool things that they allow you to do. The first one is adding a profile picture. I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but then I start seeing my face everywhere and, and start associating this kind of ownership. And, and then, you know, when, when Jack sees a file that I've shared, you know, he's actually seen me as I'm sharing it to him. Exactly. So, so it's, it's one of those, those tweaks that I always make sure to do. I always make sure to, whenever I sign up for a new service, go into my settings once again and throw on a, a profile picture so I can kind of see where it shows up in my day-to-day -day workflow. Uh, the next is the activity. So we had talked about this activity application before, and here's where you get to start configuring it in the settings. And and for what it's worth, most of the applications, once you install them, will put in their new section under your personal settings here. So if you were to install a third-party application, it would pop up here and say third-party settings for this specific application. Uh, so the activity settings are able to change which activities generate notifications and how often they're sent. Now that goes hand in hand with how they're actually sent. So there are two options you have there. You can have them sent via the, the actual Nextcloud interface. Like it has a little alerts button on the top of it. And it says, you know, you have so many um, notifications uh, pending. Uh, of of that you've chosen to to indicate yeah um, or you can have them emailed out to you in a digest um, so I prefer twice a day to have my notifications emailed out to me uh, and that's almost on every kind of service so that's that's anything I use I want kind of like a, a morning digest and I want an evening digest uh, so that's that's the setting now I don't have a lot that Nextcloud generates for me because I don't do a lot besides uploading and downloading files that's just not stuff I want to be aware of. I'm, I'm probably already aware of. Uh, and this is going to be more so if I have a share out there that I'm expecting files to be uploaded onto, I want to be aware, I want to be notified when those files get uploaded. So that's, right. that's something that I would indicate that I would like to get an alert for. Uh, now the setting does provide a way to sign up with your email provider and have that emailed out to you. Uh, so that would probably be the easiest way, just any kind of email provider, you're gonna search um, you know, how, to, how to sign up Nextcloud with, with email. And, and you know, they're, gonna, they're gonna walk you step by step through that. Usually it's just gonna be an SMTP server address, uh, maybe not even a port if you're lucky, then your username and password, and then it should do all the rest in the background for you. But this would, this would get you set up with email notifications from Nextcloud if that's something you're you're interested in. At least that activity would show up every time you logged into Nextcloud. Uh, and then the last interesting thing here is the dark theme, which is in the accessibility accessibility subsection. And that is a native 
Nextcloud dark theme. So instead of having to enable dark reader on Nextcloud, you can enable their custom dark theme and have that be rendered instead. So that's always handy. Nice. Saves on CPU. Yeah. Moving on to the administration section of this, uh, there there are a couple of global settings for the Nextcloud instance. Um, for the administrative settings for all of the applications. Uh, this list of settings is available to all administrators right underneath their personal settings. So the recommendations that I would have here, and, and there's a slew of them, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna touch on all of them, but under the support subsection, uh, there is a list of community support links, uh, specifically to their forums and to their chat. Uh, so if you have any questions, obviously, if you're running an R Compose instance, you can always contact us and, and we'd be around to, to assist in the support of that. But more than likely, I mean, this is where we're going to, to take a look if, if we have questions, right? These, these are great resources. These are people who are dedicated round the clock to dealing with Nextcloud issues. These are people who really are passionate and who care about this. And, and they have a, they have a great community around them. So I would, I would highly recommend at least checking those out if you never have previously. Uh, the next would be the basic settings. And this is where that email server setting comes into play. This is where you're able to set that to be able to send emails from your Nextcloud instance, like, uh, and, and it, not just for activity notifications, but also for like password resets. Uh, which you can also send via email. So there's there's several things you can do, uh, and and that's always a good thing to have in your back back pocket uh, just to set up, uh, just to have your next slide instance be able to send emails through your email provider. Next is the sharing administrative option. Now this enables or disables sharing globally on your Nextcloud instance. So you as an administrator are able to disallow any type of sharing if that's not something that you would like to be happening. I mean, you can you can simply say, hey guys, I, I, I don't want this to, to be sharing. So let's go ahead and, and disable that. I don't want any shares going out. I, I want everything to stay in-house. So let's go ahead and disable sharing across the entire instance. Uh, next is uh, theming. So in addition to your profile picture as an administrator, you can also set the name of your instance, the color, the logo, and the login image of your instance. This is just a way to personalize it. It makes it a little bit more fun, you know, a little bit more yours, a little bit more customized. Uh, next is the usage survey, and that's where you would enable or disable that usage survey that we were talking about that is sent to the Nextcloud developers. Uh, like I said, that is on by default. Uh, so you can choose to turn it off if you do so choose. And lastly is the system. Now I wish I, I wish I took a snapshot of this. It's pretty cool. It, it shows a lot of the things about the underlying system. It shows the, the operating system. It shows the disk space. Um, it shows the actual hardware down to like the CPU type. So like, Jack, if you're wondering what our DigitalOcean CPU, uh, our, our, our processors are, yeah, it shows, it shows you know, uh, the, the clock speed and it shows the processor type and all that. So it's really cool to be able to go in there and, and, and see that for something that's, you know, on a cloud. And you can see, well, this is an actual real thing. <laughs> it's, it's actually running on, it's actually running on this, right? <laughs> it's actually a server. Go figure. So it's, it, that was, that was cool to see. Um, you can see uh, the network, the shares, and all the active users information as well. Uh, so just an overview of the system as a whole. Uh, it's it's a really good uh, way to to standardize what you're looking at and uh, and be able to get at a at a glance uh, what's going on with your instance. Um, maybe it's slow and and you see that your CPU is being hammered or something, right? You can you can start diagnosing bottlenecks from that point. Uh, but that is all I have for applications, built-in applications and settings. Uh, so I, I, I think I could have, did a good job as, as far as you know what, what is available to you uh, right when your instance is deployed and ready. Right? This, is, this is what you're able to immediately log in and say, oh, let me start tweaking stuff. Let me start you know, looking into how I want to set up my instance, how I want to customize it, how I want to make it mine. This is the way 
to make your instance unique to you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack, and he's going to tell us how he made Rails and MVC frameworks unique to us. I think starting off here, just to kick it off, before I even say anything, the reason I chose Rails, and don't hurt me for this, there's a gem device built on Warden for authentication and authorization. And guess what? It does its job and it does it well. I don't have to worry about both of those things. I don't have to worry about authentication and authorization. So I just said, hey, this is very easy to implement. I think I'm just going to go slide into Ruby and Rails and do this and loved it. I, I, it was part of that. It was partially that. It was partially Django at the time when I kind of picked up Rails was, you know what? No. Django's around, I think, 2000. I think Django might have been around before, which is the Python equivalent of Ruby on Rails. Um, both are MVC frameworks. I think Python, I think uh, Django came out a year earlier than Rails, if I'm not mistaken. It was, they, were, they came out 2003, 2004. I forget which one came first, but maybe it just boils down to the personal preference on Rails. I feel like I've done a lot of rambling. So I think I'm going to dive into what I have, which is what is model view controller? What is Ruby on Rails and why we kind of use Ruby on Rails? Even though I already kind of pointed out yeah, authentication you, authorization. Yeah. You, you gave away so, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There's dessert first. <laughs> um, but getting into model view controller, it's a, it's a web framework for interacting with data, right? It's uh, the user interacts with the view. The view alerts the controller of an event. The controller updates the model. The model alerts the view that it has changed, and the view grabs the model data and up and basically updates itself. Do you ever do you ever get the feeling that there's websites okay, yeah. that websites are basically a it, way to display in a very pretty way what amounts yeah. to an Excel spreadsheet? Yes, <laughs> or a database. You could go as simple as a database. <laughs> It's like on the back end, everything's a, everything's a database. Everything's holding data (laughs) and you're just making it pretty for my eyes. That's exactly what it is. (laughs) That is 100% exactly how the internet operates. (laughs) So what you're saying is, is MVC is a way to make that suck less for you. As a developer. Right. That's exactly what it is. It's a way for me to not have to write javascript that touches a database i don't have to write embedded sql into javascript queries i could if i went node.js but no not doing that um so the framework kind of manages front ends the logic i call it business logic and then your back end in your database all kind of groups it into ah man what do i want to say here one it's Everything's under one. Everything's under one sun, right? I, I guess is the easiest way to explain it. Um, as a developer, I can stay within the same application and develop. I, I'd like to develop logic all the way through, so it goes. I've kind of already explained it, um, but the view talks to the controller, right? The controller talks to the database. The database kind of comes back, and the view. So the view is updated, basically. So these are three for, things. Just to just to dumb it down, just a just a tad. So these are these are three sections sitting on top of each other that talk to each other sequentially. Do they do they kind of all interact as one, or or are they like one feeds to the second, feeds to the third, and then all the way back up the stack? Yeah, it's. That's a good question because the way I kind of see it and the way I've kind of built most of the Rails application, it's obviously around the data that's in the database, but everything kind of filters through that controller. The controller has to say to the database, hey, I want this served when this is requested from the front end. So I'd say everything kind of passes through the controller to get the data um, and show the data and manipulate the data, but really it's about all three and most 
they say uh, it's uh, fat model, skinny controllers is the um, kind of phrase that I hear a lot. It's, uh, you know, putting more of the logic in the models instead of in your controllers because those controllers are basically just your HTTP methods, essentially. You know, you can, you're um, posting, getting, putting, updating, deleting, and a lot of that controller logic takes care of those items. So if you're really manipulating the data, you're supposed to do it in that, in the database, in the model. And it's the uh, ORM, basically what actually talks to the database and kind of what manipulates the data in there. And then obviously your view, that's, you sign into any kind of website, that's what you're getting. That's what's right in front of you. So the view is the front end part of it. It's, yes. it's what yeah. the web page it's, it's look, the, looks like. It's and the okay. HTML, it's the JavaScript, it's everything that's kind of rendered to the user. So then you have this walkthrough here, this one, two, three, four, five. How how does how does that flow? Yeah, so I already kind of touched on it, discussed it a little bit. Uh, basically, you walk up to a website, you're hit with a view. Um, you want to make so there's routing in there. I won't dive into that. Basically, you walk up to a website, you're hit with a view. To get the data that's proper, to get the data that you need, we'll just say it's a simple website. You don't need to log in or any, we're not going to do anything like that. You just want to walk up to a website and say, you know, how many bananas are in the tree? And you're a monkey and you're walking up to the website and you're like, how many bananas are in the tree? And this website, you go up, you got basically your view saying, all right, hey, he's asking how many bananas are in the tree. Let's go to our controller. Our controller is like, oh, I know where to find bananas. They're on, you know, they're stored in this this database right here and we can grab you know how many bananas kind of comes back it says t the, the controller pulls it and then just goes sends it right back to the view so it says the, con the the third one is that the controller updates the model so that's if we're making a request that's to update the data that's if we want to add a banana to the tree it, it, it's okay. a bad example but it, that's if we want to add another banana to the tree okay so like if that's if i there. if i want to figure out how many bananas are in the tree the first Simple thing i would request. do is is request from the view how many bananas are in the tree the view turns around and says hey controller where are the bananas and or how many? Or actually, it just it just passes it along. How many are where? Yeah. How many are where? And, and the the controller's like, I can tell you how many as long as I can. Let me get that from my friend the database, right? Find right. all the bananas. So it, it looks and it into the database and sees how many bananas is there and turns around and tells the view this is the answer to your question and the view like puts it in Comic Sans font and displays it to the user. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been the worst example of all time, but hey, at least it wasn't a graph or a uh, picture. <laughs> so I do have these three things here. It's the model. Okay, so it includes all the data and the related logic. The view presents the data and the user and handles the interaction. So that's kind of how you're actually pointing and clicking and the JavaScript, you know, yay, JavaScript, yay. Um, and then the controller is the interface between the model and the view. Okay. So three necessary, you need all three. Right, you can't get away with one. Um, you can't get away with just one. Well, you can if you're not. Yeah, if you're crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the most roundabout way possible, that's a model view controller. <laughs> okay. Rails basically takes this and it says, "Hey, we're a web application framework written in Ruby, and we do all three of these things pretty well. I'd say pretty well." Uh, so I really like, I tossed it in there, the Rails doctrine that's out there um, and what Rails kind of has. It's optimized for programmer happiness. I was I was actually just taking a look at this this link here and it actually gives a pretty good overview of, of what is Rails if you wanted to, to just read that through. Yeah, and that's what I have linked. Uh, I can just read it here. Actually, I'm glad you did bring this up because here we go. So Rails is a web application development framework written in the Ruby programming language. It is designed to make programming web applications easier by making assumptions about what every developer needs to get started. It allows you to write less code while accomplishing more than many other pro many other languages and frameworks. Uh, experience, Reb experience Rails developers 
also report that it makes web application development more fun. Oh, oh, really? Uh, did the is is the Rails application I agree. I'll page? Agree. All right, all right. I mean, it sounds like you're kind of patting yourself on the back there, Rails, but whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. met DHH. I've seen anything from that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Second paragraph here. This this is kind of important. Rails is opinionated software. It makes the assumption that there is a best way to do things, and mm. it's designed to encourage that way, mm -hmm. and in some cases to discourage alternatives. Mm. If you learn the Rails way, I think that's the guide and a maybe a book, a book? you'll probably okay. discover a tremendous increase in productivity. If you persist in bringing old habits from other languages to your Rails development and trying to use patterns you learned elsewhere, you may have a less happy experience. Like me, trying to make all your Rails code Pythonic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no comment on no comment on the matter <laughs> uh the rails philosophy includes two major principles two major guiding principles don't repeat yourself uh acronym is dry is a principle soft is a principle of software development which states that every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. By not writing the same information over and over again, our code is more maintainable, more extensible, and less buggy. Huh. Okay, I could have used that one when writing. Uh, we got an R Compose library. Uh, it should yeah. be a library um, that is, for communicating with our servers. That is definitely going to be one of our pillars in <laughs> Q2, by the way. I've been thinking about that more and more. Uh, and then this uh, second one here is convention over configuration. Rails has opinions about the best way to do things, the best way to do many things in a web application, and defaults to the set of conventions rather than require you to sp specify you know, the minutia through endless configuration files. So when you spin up a Rails application, it kind of picks a lot of the defaults for you and gets you up and running. And then it essentially hands you what – it hands you almost – I don't want to call it a pre-baked application, but essentially it is a pre-baked application. It, it kind of hands you exactly what you need to edit. There are about four things that you need to do to really start you know, building a web app. Um, well, I, and, I actually like to – to equate these types of things to like getting a Lego, what do you call those? Not boxes, packages, Lego. Like a set. Like yeah, like, a, like yeah, a set. set. Yeah, like getting a Lego set, you come home and you open the box and it's all pretty much put together for you except for like where the figurine should go and like what you want to do with it and where the little stickers that you want on, right? In the sense that you could take it all apart you 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 could just dismantle the entire thing right. and rebuild it from scratch in the exact way you want it but what it's handing you is something that's functional out of the box and ready to go in case all you want you to do is to get to play with it yeah put the parts together right all you have to do is put the parts together and that's a great example a lot better than the uh bananas and uh getting bananas <laughs> you're a monkey and you walk up to a computer <laughs> how many bananas are in tree <laughs> all right <laughs> so, that, uh, so i can well we just went over the doctrine right and and yeah they yeah so they have you have okay these yeah i'm points. glad yeah. yeah um so the things i kind of made a note of were optimizing for programmer happiness Convention over configuration, which we kind of covered. Don't repeat yourself and value integrated systems. Now, this one I found very interesting. I put a quote here from the uh, website from their doc doctrine. I have it linked in the show notes, but it's uh, the quote is, Rails can be used in many contexts, but its first love is the making of integrated systems. Majestic monoliths. This is coming straight from their doctrine. Yep. A whole system that addresses an entire problem. This means that Rails is concerned with everything from the front-end JavaScript needed to make the live updates to how the database is migrated from one version to another in production. Now, this is very interesting to me, at least, um, especially with Rails 5 and 6. Uh, they're taking on that JavaScript ecosystem, whereas before it really felt Ruby, Ruby and Log... Ruby, I'd say Ruby-heavy and more of a logic-based framework. Um, 
with five and six, uh, they moved to Webpacker. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it. I remember is, you complaining about it. Oh, it's because it went from hey, you know, add jQuery or hey, guess what? We bundled, you know, Bootstrap CSS, you know, precompiled into root like. They bundled it into a library, a gem library, so you could just pull it via Ruby. Now it's, I guess what, I have separate dependencies to manage as a developer. I manage JavaScript dependencies, and I manage Ruby dependencies now. Whereas before it was, everything came through Ruby, which made it a heck of a lot easier, right? My small gripe. I, I don't even know if it's a gripe, but my well, um, one a, thing of note. It's a big change. I it's, mean, it, it is it's a speaking on more and more. You can't just walk up to, I, I feel like you probably can get away with it. You can't just walk up to the application anymore and go, Hey, look, I can spin this up. You kind of have to know what's going on. I feel it, it. I don't know if it made it a harder barrier, barrier entry. Maybe it's just me coming to it from a, a simpler, you know, setting up a lot simpler pages, uh, a lot, a lot more simpler applications. Um, but it's definitely, it was a noticeable change for me to have to start to manage JavaScript dependencies. Um, small plug. Luckily, I do have a uh, Docker image out there for setting up, um, I guess, a basic rail skeleton is what I call it for Webpacker. Well, it's but, the basis for which we use to build Portal and Command Center. Right, right. Those, that, those Docker images, absolutely. You could... M manipulate those to you could take out all the logic we have there and you'd be fine um but last kind of point here is the api I, i'd say rails is getting better it, it's the one thing i'd say it doesn't do well is uh the apis now they're i want to say they're getting better because they started uh, API only, and this is where I was kind of wanting to dive into Java web tokens versus, you know, sessions, but essentially Rails was always kind of built with that you, I want to, I want to like call it we user, serve HTML. User, right, exactly. We don't serve JSON kind of deal. You hit a web page and we serve HTML, like period. Which is, exactly. has, has been the web for the past 30 odd years. But, you know, everyone's moving towards API development and, you know, pull it whatever way you want and then have your front end developer pull using React and React really likes JSON objects. So I'd say they're getting better. It's definitely a, what do I want to call it? A point of improvement that's out there. So Something what's... That What's this? I mean, we got time. So, like, what's this session versus? Um, so, the big thing with those is I was actually pulling up a thing on authentication here. Um, essentially, with server, what it boils down to is where you're storing authentication methods. Uh, not method, not, you know, procedures to authenticate, but where you're storing the data for authentication. And with sessions, you're storing them server side. So when I walk up with my, when I want to authenticate with my laptop to a server, I basically create a session, the session stored on that server and in my local, on my local storage. And I basically just match. It's essentially, you know, one-to-one. -one. It's like, hey, this user has this session. Does that, is that what they have? Yes. Okay. They're fine to read this data. But with Java Web Token, what's essentially happening is it's stored on the client side, the token stored on the client side, and then basically what the server has is a method that can hash what you send them, you know, and then it checks that function to say, oh, yep, this is this user is able to authenticate. So instead of comparing, you're basically running a method against, which makes it th the big. Um, what I want to say, the big bottleneck for sessions is that horizontal scaling. You kind of need a, the RAM for it. Um, obviously, it's not a, a problem we're running into right now. Um, 
We don't have a lot of users. We're not a big social media platform. We don't have a ton of users signed in at once. We're basically deploy and then you got your own server, set of services. I mean, you're really not going to be hitting those issues. So Java Web Token puts it on the kind of puts it on the client. Now there are concerns with this security and otherwise. The one is uh, storing the token securely. You know, if you store it on your local machine, what's stopping anyone from grabbing that? Obviously, there are methods in place, but it's still a concern. Um, transporting it, fine. And then uh, session. The other thing I've seen was Java JSON web tokens can be hard to invalidate. And then the other one is uh, trusting the client's claim. Now, I don't have a ton of information. I just kind of started digging into this more and more. But it's one of those things, you know, understanding that it's out there. You have session authentication versus token authentication. So how does this, how does this impact API development in the Rails ecosystem, API development for an in particular application? And how does that, both of those, how do, how do both of those relate back to the old a user accesses a web page and a served HTML? Like, what's the implication there? So basically, you're moving... A lot of these front ends are moving towards React. So basically, you deliver an entire... Uh, what are they called? Single wet, single, single page applications, I think is what they're called. And essentially, with these single page applications, you are making API calls via JavaScript, and you can use your, you can use that token to continuously pull, pull or pull data down as it's you know as it's at the server. You can basically just pull it and just, all right, need it now. I need it now. I need it. You know, and a lot of a lot of the view or what you're seeing is just updated up front, and then you know, it's you're seeing it pull on the back end as data gets updated into the server. Um, I think it's a lot, the main thing would be it's a lot faster. Uh, you don't have to refresh the page every time you want to see a change. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of getting into more React versus, you know, conventional HTML pages and JavaScript, but... Um, I mean, if that's what it is, it's kind. That of, is kind of what it is. It, essentially, at the end of the day, you're hitting. You know, you have your front end, which is React. It's separated. It you're basically getting away from MVC. It's. I feel like we kind of we're away from it. We kind of converge on MV, MVC, and then we're kind of getting. You know, it's kind of splitting again, where it's front end and back end. The front end does its job, and the back end does its job. And you know, I, I'm splitting view versus you know controller and model well you so, have the you yeah it, that would that would almost be like a ui bldb layer where you have the ui front end layer that talks to the business logic that sits there in the middle and does all your your logic and your database calls from that level and there there is no third level there it, right it, it combines it, the the model and the controller right. yeah which is which is brilliant kind of, which, for API access because all I have to hit is the it's an API an end yeah, node right yeah. as a backend developer you don't have to write templates anymore you don't yeah. have to write HTML you basically just write all right what does the front end developer need you know what data do they need you just return it as JSON you just say this is your problem you make it pretty yeah you make that. the you know, grass I, return, I don't want to make the grass yeah I don't want to make the grass right right and I think that's what we're starting to see you just hit an API anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, it's that's that's how people are preferring to 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 get these integrations. I mean, that's that's what allows us to do our you know our, our runners. I mean, we're we're able to hit the APIs of of all of these these services, right? We're able to authenticate as a user. We're able to manipulate what we need to and and display it. Like that's that's on us. We're we're using it to create. Excel spreadsheets. We're using it to create emails. We're not using it to to form HTML pages, right? We're we're doing stuff with these the the data, yeah, with the, with the data that's that's being generated for us than than anything else, right? I mean, well, then then the HTML would, right? And and by doing that, I mean we're doing that to help 
groups and communities become more productive. I mean, that's that's what we're doing. What whether we're 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 using you know this this MVC framework or whether we're using a UI BL, you know, wh wherever we're we're interacting, we're we're trying to to figure out new ways to to hit these services and make these services work for you guys, and and so that you guys can come become more productive by using these open source technologies, right? So in order to do that, go ahead and sign up for an instance of our Compose today. And we'll go ahead and, and get you on that bandwagon to, to help you start becoming more productive. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Compose cast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.